Brilliant. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming along to this Ask Me Anything session tonight. I'm absolutely thrilled to be hosting this with the wonderful Marianne and the equally wonderful Sophie. And we've had some brilliant, brilliant questions submitted. So I'm really, really excited. And I'm really looking forward to learning as well. Um, we are um, trialing a new format tonight. So I apologize if it's slightly clunky, but we're holding this as an event where we have invited some people from our private training for influence closed community to come along um, within the zoom and to ask questions live and to participate if they would like to but we also have questions that people have submitted in advance that I will be asking the panel about um, and you guys on um, Facebook you can put anything you like within the Facebook live chat box and I will do my best to answer those questions as well. Now, Sophie and Marianne have both given up their time to really help raise awareness this week because it is Neurodiversity Celebration Week and we really want to focus on, uh, on neurodiversity and women. You know, these guys are operational experts. From a personal perspective, they've got their own journeys and from a professional perspective, working and training, forte training in these areas. And so tonight we might not get through all of the questions that have been submitted. We will do our best, but I am only going to keep them until nine o'clock. Both of them have jobs and both of them would like to relax and have some sleep and look after themselves um, this evening as well. So we will do our very best from eight till nine to answer as many of your questions as we possibly can. But there will also be the opportunity for you to um, ask any further questions within the Facebook group or within the Training for Influence um, community. So as you know, Training for Influence is our training methodology and it's about training being um, run by an operational expert like these guys with subject matter expertise, expert facilitation skills, being tailored to the organization, engaging and interactive and values led in its delivery. All of these sessions in the future will be run within our closed but free training community. So please do come along and join. We will put the links in. Um, we will start graduating off doing them live on Facebook, but they will be put on YouTube and they will be available as a podcast as well. So we're just changing our methodology just to make sure that these are available for as many people as possible. Um, so that's enough from me. I'm the director of TAE, Tammy Banks, and it's my absolute pleasure to hand over to the most important people in the in the Zoom room tonight, um, Sophie and Mariam. Um, Sophie, if you don't mind, I'm going to start with you because um, you're, you've got experience. You've done an Ask Me Anything with us on domestic abuse before, if I remember rightly. So I don't feel like I'm picking on you if I go first. Um, would you mind telling people why you're here um, and why you're doing this Ask Me Anything? Uh, yeah, of course. Hi, everybody. Um, so the reason I'm here is I was recently diagnosed with autism. My um, formal diagnosis was actually uh, two weeks ago now, I think, just about, although I've obviously known for a while. Um, so, yeah, other than that, I'm a TAE facilitator and have been for a couple of years. Um, so that's why I'm here. Fantastic. Brilliant, Sophie. Um, really pleased to have you here as well. Um, thank you for giving up some of your time this evening. Um, Marianne, over to you. Hi, um, I'm Marianne. I was diagnosed with ADHD last year. Um, unlike Sophie, I didn't know. <laughs> um, I kind of um, always felt like I was a bit different to other people, but just thought that I was a bit rubbish and a bit silly and a bit scatty and not liked by people and uh, I read something somewhere about it and then I mentioned it to a friend who's on here now, Dave, and um, he said yeah I kind of knew you always were. <laughs> um, so yeah then I looked into it and I was very fortunate that we've got private health and I was able to be diagnosed. So um, yeah and on the back of that though uh, my son had anxiety like I was diagnosed for many years and he has been diagnosed with it too and borderline um, 
autism, but we'll talk about that one in a bit. Brilliant. Thank you, Marianne. And thank you for um, as well giving up your time tonight and be willing to, being willing to share some of that story, because I think that's one of my favourite things about um, Tay uh, is the fact that with the subject matter expertise, it's generally full of people telling their personal and professional stories. Um, and I just think that that's that's quite magic because I know that me and you have had conversations about your journey um, and kind of actually where I'm at and what I'm exploring and things at the moment. And I just think that being open and honest about anything, anything that's complex, anything in our lives, um, just encourages and inspires and gives other people, I guess, um, enables other people's bravery to actually explore it a little bit more, doesn't it? So um, yeah, thank you for doing that. So, so let's kick off with some of the questions that we've been submitted then. Um, I. As I said, I might not get through all of them, but I will certainly get through as many as I possibly can. And the first ones um, are ones that I think are brilliant just to start this session with before we kind of move into anything else. Um, and I'm going to kind of connect them all together to an extent. So it's we've got three. What is neurodiversity? One literally says, what is autism? And one literally says, what is ADHD? Um, so I'll come over to you first, Sophie, and I'll just um, just ask and just say those three questions. Um, what do they mean to you and kind of what's your response? Um, so I guess in, in the kind of the most basic sort of, um, I guess, medical kind of way of looking at this, ADHD and, and autism are neurodevelopmental disorders and I'm going to put disorders very much in inverted commas there um there but in kind of terms of of the way that most neurodivergent people experience it it's just a different way of of existing of being our brains are wired in a slightly different way from most people's um and that means that we might have some behaviors or some ways of 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 thinking of experiencing the world that are just that little bit off center really and so we can sometimes be seen as a little bit quirky a little bit weird um and then for people who maybe have more significant needs um as a result of their autism or their adhd may not speak or makes may kind of have some behaviors like stims and things that can be seen as weird basically by by other people so it's it's just a different way of being that's really interesting because you've kind of flipped it on its head a little bit and said well actually the adhd and autism are neurodiversities yeah. um do you know and like you'd said neuro and then in inverted commas um disorders mm -hmm. and it's about the brain working differently isn't it you know it's not about better or worse it's about it's about exactly the wording that you've used there about about differently and kind of appreciating that a little bit um it's interesting as well actually and marianne i'm going to come over to you because i know that we just before we we started um we were taught you were telling me about something you posted on linkedin earlier um and actually um you were talking about actually uh, was it brain scans and how that yes, shows. Can you explain that a little bit. Um, well, from I mean, I've worked in um, health and social care for many years. I've worked with, uh, and I'm going to say this, and I hold my hands up with children with ADHD, naughty boys, because that's how I did see it, and I and I hold my hands up that that's how I did see it for many many years, and that's kind of how it was seen. So now I was thinking about different myths around it because for me, it's a fairly new thing that I've been diagnosed with. And thinking that um, many, I've heard it said before, and of course I'm very much on the attack <laughs> when I hear people say, oh, it's not really a thing, is it? You know, And I say, well, it very much is a thing actually, because, um, and again, I've spoken with David that meant about this, about um, brain scans. So what I did on, uh, on LinkedIn today was saying about how you can see it, because people say, well, it's not a real thing. It's not really a real thing. It's just a thing that people use as an excuse. A, it's not an excuse. It, for me, my diagnosis helped explain things, but you can see it and you can see where the brain isn't developed in those areas for people that have got 
with whichever the um whether it's ADHD or autism or, or, or dyslexia or what, whatever it is they've got and the way I looked at it was that if somebody so let's just say I've broken my leg and I had an x-ray done uh people go oh my goodness you've broken your leg um and then if it so happened that I'd fall and I'd broken my leg and I walked across the room and then afterwards people go oh my goodness you were absolutely amazing you managed to walk across the room and your leg was broken because the scan showed that your leg was broken and yet every single day Sophie and I get up and I know that I don't do things that I should um I try my hardest to do things I should and yet I get criticized for it nobody sits there and says wow weren't you amazing because you actually achieved that because you can get a because you can get an x-ray and that shows it. And yet for what we have, unless you have a brain scan for it, nobody cares. Because they just say you need to try harder. Yeah, I think even if you do have a brain scan for it, people still think that you should try harder because the approach <laughs> is very much, well, I can do it, so why can't you? Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's really harmful. It is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that was the best way I could. Uh, yeah, I, I love that. And I love that the visual of the brain scan and, I, and the, the type of person I am for my learning styles, that really connects for me. Because actually, if you had a broken leg and you're right and you, I don't know, walked around town all day, everybody would be kind of cheering you. Um, but actually, if you equate that to um, a neurodiversity, people, th there is more of an expectation that you just fit in um and manage what other people can manage um and so that it's a really interesting way of explaining it quite simply to people as well um can i come back to you and just ask um from a because from a differential perspective do you know so if we're talking we hear people say all of the time like you've just said they're dyslexia um and um, I know somebody sent in a question about connections with dyspraxia, which we'll come to. Um, and then we've talked about ADHD and autism. So are they all neurodiversities? What's the, do you know, when you look at autism and ADHD in particular, what's the, what's the similarities and differences? Or, or are they kind of, do you know, unpick that for us? <laughs> oh, uh, tricky one, isn't it? I think, so neurodiversity is really kind of a, the, the most simple way is just differences in the brain, right? Um, so these are all slightly different differences in the brain, if that makes sense. Um, so ADHD might be characterized by certain behaviors or certain difficulties in certain areas and autism in has sort of slightly different characteristics. Similarly, dyslexia has slightly different characteristics, such as dyspraxia and, and all other kinds of neurodiversities they do tend to be found together quite often um though i am waiting currently to be assessed for for adhd um and one of the things that was kind of pointed out to me by the the specialist who who did my autism assessment was that it's really really common for people to have both um which is which is a whole other kind of can of worms because they the, the, the symptoms from each tend to fight each other a little bit um so that can be interesting to live with um hang on hang on just rewind a little bit tell us a little yeah. bit more about that symptoms from each can kind of um fight against each other so tell us a little bit more about the symptoms from each so for example people with autism tend to really like um routine for example um that's something that really kind of helps us but people do with ADHD, ADHD as well yeah but people with ADHD <laughs> it can be really difficult to stick to those routines and that's kind of like, no, the things that really help my autism, Don't help. my ADHD is fighting. Um, <laughs> so it can be, it, that can make things just that little extra level of, of, of difficult, um, of finding ways to, um, I guess, to manage those, those differences and those difficulties that we might experience. So, um, but yeah, they, they say they're often found found together, and that's sometimes referred to as comorbidities. Um, and I was also told, interestingly, by my my specialist that there are kind of a whole range of other health conditions that are associated with autism and ADHD. 
and things like chronic pain conditions. A fibromyalgia, um, I'm hearing a lot. Yeah, so I actually have on. fibromyalgia. Um, I have fibromyalgia and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is also associated with autism and ADHD. As are things like endometriosis and irritable bowel syndrome, and a whole kind of range of things that kind of group together um, and are seen very commonly together. So that's from a scientific perspective, that's really really fascinating. But also from a, a lived experience perspective, understanding that these things can come together. I think can make for me anyway for me personally it made me feel a little bit less like I was just broken so did know, you yeah. did you kind of think oh my gosh oh my gosh every time yeah I, I was like oh wow I just thought that was like, yeah I just thought I was I, I was, was crap rubbish. or rubbish yeah. or lazy or <laughs> stupid or something and then it was like my whole life is not being... mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's like <laughs> and that explains so much that and, yeah. that and that and that and that and that <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah yeah and it's a lifetime yeah. of then unpicking that stuff isn't it and and figuring out what the impact is and how yeah. we can then go about and and deal with that and and go forward and have a, a life that is I should say better right. but, but yeah but more yeah. you know more kind of fulfilling and happy and you know all of those things okay do you know, Sophie, I that's interesting because I've not I've not heard about those kind of I guess those comorbidities or those connections. But mm. as you're saying it, I've over the last couple of years, um, lots of people who I spend lots of my time with um and um are going through this this process of assessment at, at the moment, um, and all have just gone through this process of assessment. And actually, as you're saying that, I'm literally thinking oh yeah and that person suffered with that for ages or for years or oh oh my god do you know so actually I, I I can just resonate with that just from hearing it for the first time from you from you today really it's interesting because with my eldest all of the things that I got him assessed because he'd had lots of problems that were put down to anxiety all of my things were put down to anxiety and of course now I've been assessed he has been interested in what you said Sophie the ADD he was diagnosed with I still disagree with some of that but the um, autism because school said they didn't see any of those things um, mm. he they discredited what we said about him and said it was biased so despite the fact the psychiatrist saw it two of them they discredited it and said it, they'd have to sit on the fence with it. And I said, well, at the school he goes to, you're not allowed to be yourself. And because he's so strict, because of his autism, about not letting people see what he does, there we go. That's why you're not saying what he does. And yeah, I even had a conversation with the school and they said, uh, yeah, I said, you know, he obviously masks. And they went, yeah. And I'm like, well, why did you fill in the form like that? <laughs> so. yeah. Well, that actually that brings us on, I guess, nicely to to um, uh, from a from an assessment process as well, because Marianne, you said um, you were lucky you had private healthcare, so it was quite a, uh, you could go for it quite quickly. I know you're in some other groups where some people are waiting six years for local authority assessments. Sophie, you've just been through your assessment, and it was kind of a multiple multiple approach wasn't it Do you know um if we can focus just for a second with regards to kind of women and neurodiversity um can you i'll come to you um first sophie and just say from your kind of experience um the the, the differences that are seen within that assessment process and how complicated that assessment process is um where are we at with it i guess yeah so i think particularly when it comes to women and girls, there's been um, historically the idea of, of as I think as Marianne put it earlier, kind of like naughty boys um, and of particularly ADHD, but also autism, seeing very much as something that affects boys. Um, and so girls tended to be diagnosed with things like borderline personality disorder, or even if we go even further back as just being hysterical. Um, 
rather than having their difficulties actually recognized. And we also have this kind of this whole kind of extra layer of stuff sitting on top of that, of what the our societal expectations are towards boys and towards girls, so that boys can be, you know, badly behaved. And it's kind of like, well, it's just what boys are like, right? But when girls do it, it's treated slightly differently. And so what that means when we add those things together is that it's often missed in girls or it's seen as being something else. Um, and so girls tend not to be assessed um, at all when they're, when they're small. Um, and even today, girls tend to be, it tends to be recognised and assessed later in girls than it does in boys. My niece was only assessed when she was, I think, eight or nine. Um, and, you know, boys would be, it would tend to be picked up, you know, when they're sort of maybe three or four. So there's that difference. And then that means that there is um, obviously less intervention earlier on, um, which can be a good thing or a bad thing, depending. But that's kind of a different question. Um, but then in terms of the assessment process, I don't know if you're coming to that as an adult or as a teenager, there's kind of extra layers of it because you've probably learned to mask over that time. And again, particularly women and girls tend to mask more um, because you go through life and there are these expectations on you. Explain a little bit what you mean by masking. masking and I also yeah. meant to say earlier, ex can you explain what you mean by stimming as well? Sorry. Yeah. OK, so masking is um, basically exactly, pretty much what it says on the tin is hiding the things that make us different. So a stim is a usually repetitive behavior. Um, so when I was little, I used to rock. Um, and um, one of the things that I realized I started doing actually during lockdown was this. So I wiggle my hands like this. Um, again. Yeah, I pick my hands and na nails, I pull my hair, I, you know, all these sorts of repetitive kind of behaviours, which are really, really, um, which are really common. And what they are is people tend to see them as being something that um, happens when autistic people particularly are, are distressed. Um, and so it can be linked as being seen as like, that's the thing that's distressing you. And so it must be stopped, but actually stims are self-soothing behaviours. They're the things that, that neurodivergent people do to help them get through whatever stressful situation that they're in. So a stim is something that actually should be, you should be encouraged to be able to do freely. Um, so yeah, so that's what a, that's what a stim is. Um, and I've lost my thread very slightly there. <laughs> because so exactly, no, actually um, what I was going to say there is that's really interesting because you've just said two things so you said about girls being um particularly good at masking um mm. and kind of hiding hiding how they're feeling fitting in I know certainly when um I was speaking to specialists about getting um my teenage daughter assessed one of the things that they'd said is they use the term high functioning and mm. what they said was um that actually she's so intelligent what she's done is assess the situation and then become a chameleon within that yeah. situation yeah, um, and, yeah, yeah. Well, watch what other people I, do and copy. i know for me yeah. um looking back uh, when i spoke to my psychiatrist because i did gymnastics and he said that probably it gave me because i was very very disciplined with everything mm. and it gave me somewhere to be like, I mean, I never did. I get told off for talking sometimes at school. Surprise, surprise. Um, but other than that, I was just me. Nobody saw me. If I explained myself when I was younger, I was just her. That was it. And, and just really hidden away and focused on your gymnastics. And, yeah, I, if I look back, and I even look back at what I was going to do, so I did my GCSEs. I wasn't stupid, um, whatever stupid is, but I was, I worked hard and, you know, um, and then I did quite well in my GCSEs and, and literally school went, oh, what are you going to do now then? And I was like, I don't know, A-levels maybe. So I did, but I feel like I kind of drifted through the whole of everything going, because nobody ever thought anything of, like, they literally didn't ever 
Yeah, well, that's one of the things that um, the lady said to me who I was speaking to was that girls go under the radar because they quite often they become just no bother whatsoever um, <laughs> because actually there's a social anxiety connected to it and people pleasing and wanting to fit in and, you know, so actually um, that's... But the, the point that I wanted to make was you said, Sophie, you said two opposite things, really. You said about um, masking and how people can quite often, girls can quite often get really good at masking and so they go under the radar. But then you also said about stimming and, and explain that stimming can be, um, it can be quite extreme behaviour, can be a whole kind of host of different stims that people have and that yeah. that should be encouraged. But actually if stimming helps and that is a relief from the explanation that you gave, but somebody's masking and trying to fit in, being seen to stim isn't fitting in at all. So how do you square that circle? I've been know? shamed. Yeah. Yeah. Have you, Sophie? I I never realised it was a thing. I've yeah. always picked the skin. I've got scars on my fingers. Yeah. And I've had people say, "Oh God, you're doing that again, Marianne." And then I'd make I literally want to punch them in the face for saying it to me because yeah. I was. They were going, you mustn't do this like this. And I was like, oh, yeah. don't tell me what to do. Um, and actually, since I found out I had it, I'm like, it's just something I do. Yeah, yeah. I think it's the masking thing is like, I, I don't see masking as being a positive thing. Um, I think masking is something that we do in order to make neurotypical people feel more comfortable so that we fit into a world that is designed for neurotypical people um, and it's something that we are pressured into doing because if we don't then we're seen as weird and we are difficult yeah we're weird we're difficult <laughs> we don't make friends we and you know I, I think you know the the interesting thing is I've heard often said and I, I think I, I do feel like this as well is that the mask has friends and you have friends and they're not necessarily the same friends because you're oh, Sophie, that because the people who understand who to understand you as the truth of who you are aren't necessarily the same people who can cope who who, who want to be friends with your mask and the people who like you when you mask because you're hiding who you truly are your mask is hiding the real it's interesting so when i used to have, when i used to have parties i used to say i've got my misfit friends Yes. And when I said my misfit friends, they were probably people who were very much like me, because I always say I don't really get on with women en masse, because mm. I just probably don't like most of them, and I can't pretend that I do, which is really mm. awful, I know, but um, so I just kind of I either get myself in trouble by putting myself in those situations, or I put myself away from them, but then, yeah, I've got my mis misfit friends, and they're quite proud to be my misfit friends as well. Yeah, when I yeah. found friends who are also neurodivergent, <laughs> that was like, it was this wonderful little moment yeah. where I've never had close friendships until maybe three or four years ago. Um, like really close friendships with people who I could be completely comfortable and be myself with. And finding that um, community with people who are also neurodivergent, who get you, who you're not ashamed to be around to be your entire authentic self around is like it, it's it's An awakening life changing yeah and it's genuinely life-changing um and there are people who are friends with my mask and i'm not sure how i feel about that see i sophie when i found out probably a lockdown actually did it for me but when I found out I was diagnosed I then realized that I'd been people pleasing my whole life and that's why I fell out with people because I was trying to people please and actually I realized I probably didn't like most people uh, and now I just go do I like you do I not do you do it for me do you not if you don't mm, well you go your way and I'll go mine yeah I've fallen with so many people so many people <laughs> I spend my life falling out of people. Well, yeah. I don't now because now I just don't go for them. Absolutely, yeah. And now I, I'm like, okay, well, that's a person I'm not going to get on with. So I'm not going to try and be yes. friends with them. Yes. Because I don't, yeah. It's not good for me and it's not good for them. Yeah, either. that's exactly it. Yeah, that's it was great. Really, me, really, for me, Marianne. it was like, that's okay. Sorry. 
let me just interrupt that. I just want to say, I want you to continue what you're talking about, but just can you lace into it whether your diagnosis made this difference? Because actually, both like I, when Sophie said people are friends of the mask and friends of me, literally, like I could feel my heart. It's like that, that is quite devastating. Um, but then as you've spoken and you've talked about yourselves and what, what you do now and how you make those conscious decisions, both of you have got these big smiles on your face and you've both become really quite animated about it. And it, it literally looks physically like the pressure is just releasing as you're talking. So just as you're talking, will you lace into actually whether the diagnosis made a difference? Because there's a whole debate about whether adult women should bother in invert commas to get diagnosed and i know that it's a complete personal um choice how you're interacting and feeling now for, um I, I don't know I, for me um the day i was diagnosed i owned who i am i stopped being ashamed because i don't think i I probably, without really realising, I was bullied when I was younger and I always felt like I was disliked by everybody. And I got I got the diagnosis. And for me, because I've gone privately, it's meant that in terms of medication, I've got to pay to be titrated, which is just a crazy amount of money. And yes, it might help me focus, but actually knowing what I know now, I kind of take matters into my hand and I've got various people in my life that I try and get to help me with those things. Um, but yeah, the, the moment I was diagnosed, I was like, yeah, that's me. And I'm happy with me. And I'm really proud of who I am actually. Either like me or don't, because if you don't, that's fine. I don't know, yeah. Sophie, if you felt like that, but. Yeah, very similar, yeah. I think, I think because I'd known for quite a long time and because it's something that I, I essentially saw my niece kind of living my childhood, essentially, only with with more knowledge and support. But she is experiencing a lot of the same things I was experiencing. And so um, I kind of had a pretty good idea. Um, and that's kind of why I went for assessment in the first place. Um, so I've kind of had a little bit of a run up to that kind of, I think, um, acceptance of, of myself. But the day that I got diagnosed, absolutely, it was like the relief was just palpable. I was so scared they were going to say, no, you're just a bit of a dick. Um, you know, <laughs> uh, but, um, <laughs> but, but, you know, so it, so it was really it was a relief and it was really validating because it was like, OK, yeah, my experience is real. Um, I'm not just making this up. I'm not just making excuses for the person that, you know, that I am. And I can kind of go forward now and being my authentic self. And also in, I think it's that self-knowledge and being able to then have the language to explain to other people as well what my needs are and to not be apologetic about that, you know, that this is what I need. And I did, that's I did that the other day, Sophie, with somebody and mm. I actually challenged them head on an education business because I didn't react in the way this person wanted me to. And I was very open and I opened up and I said, actually, can I just tell you that? And I said, to which the person said, oh, I'm really sorry, I didn't know you had those needs. And then literally listed a barrage of all of what I hadn't done and what I should have done. And then said, but I really like to have a meeting with you. And I'm like, I don't want one with you actually. And I actually complained about that person because I was like, I actually even in there said all the things that would help me, but this person just totally didn't, they didn't see this, I don't even know how old I am now, 44, 45 year old woman as somebody who would have those needs, if you see what I mean. And I'm thinking, goodness me, this is an education company. You know, I'm a teacher and I've just been really open with you about what I need. And you just smacked me right back in the face with it. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I think also something you've touched on there is that as adults, it's kind of seen as something that we should just get over, whereas it's like, oh, we, that lack of understanding that children with ADHD and with autism grow into adults with autism and ADHD. You know, we still have the same challenges as we as we age. It's just that sometimes we hit, you know, a certain age and it's not acceptable anymore. 
and and that's really I think it's really interesting that it's seen as a as a, a problem in childhood rather than recognizing that it's lifelong because this is a neurodevelopmental issue it's it's you know it happens it's present from birth and it will be present until the day we die you know it's it's lifelong. Yeah, a lot of it is as well I've seen that um I know for me I, I look back and then I think maybe I've had children and maybe the symptoms have become a lot more prevalent because mm -hmm. I'm trying to juggle a husband two kids two kids one's got a heart condition the other one now I found out has neurodiversity and trying to work and trying to juggle everything else um always saw myself as somebody with depression or anxiety um and you just kind of get on with it and maybe you know I'm not I'm not gonna lie I've had problems in terms of my partner understanding it saying you're not the person you were then and I said but I'm trying to juggle a lot else and so for me I have the issue of I used to really be like I'm this chaotic person that doesn't sleep and I love that and now I'm like do you do you really not love it or is it actually really quite exhausting so now that I know who I am I kind of tap into that when I need it but I'm also very aware because I know that I actually need uh routine and structure um but I know that I'm always on the flip side of probably being a bit chaotic so it's this constant battle of trying to it's like the devil and the angel, you know. Yes. Um, Marianne, do you want to go shopping? No, I've got work to do. Do you want to go shopping? You... Ah. Um, but yeah, and then you've got children added in and all the responsibilities. So I think for women, it's quite hard because you get that layer of it that you kind of lose who you are yeah. as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Think, yeah. Work. Yeah, so I'm going to relate that to a couple of questions that we've got, if that's okay. Mm. So we've we've got one that actually Marianne, you kind of linked to earlier, um, where in fact there, there's there's a couple that link together really quite nicely here. So one one talks says I think of autism as little boys without speech and struggling to engage socially. Is this still true? Um, and so that's that's an interesting question. Um, so I'd like to come to you guys and ask specifically about that, but also within the context of actually what Lindsay's asked in the chat box about kind of the, um, I get the wording right, um, high and low functioning and said how that's outdated. Um, but actually, when when you think about autism or ADHD, you, you know, I still do now, you know, naturally think, well, actually, there's some people with it more extreme than others. And I, I can I completely understand that that's not necessarily a helpful way of thinking about it. It's it's different. It's displayed it presents. presents in different ways. Yeah, displayed in different ways. Um, however, is it a case that it is worse for some people? and better for other people, more manageable, less manageable? Do, should we have terms like high and low functioning? Where, where do you sit with kind of those? I think I saw one of the questions said about spectrum. I think that isn't helpful in that some people say, well, we're all on the spectrum, aren't we? Mm. Um, which I, think, I, I saw it once where someone said, everybody needs to go to the toilet, but the frequency that they need to go will impact on their life. And I thought that was a really good way of explaining it. And it's exactly as it is that there are many things that Sophie, you find difficult, I don't, that some other people, because I know that lots of things I've looked at before, everybody does that. And I said, yeah, but it's at the point that it becomes a problem for you. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's how it is. And I think the high functioning and low functioning, I think some of that is to do with um, intellectually. I think some of that I don't think it's very helpful sometimes in terms of people still wanting to put people in boxes because I know that when I looked at Samuel with the autism someone said but you know people have the idea of them lining cars up and all that kind of stuff but interestingly for my son he uh would he won't go to sleep until I go to sleep which is quite interesting because I don't sleep <laughs> so neither of sleep um, so he literally won't go to sleep and a friend of mine lived here and she used to work late shifts and she then said what I've noticed with him is that until everybody's in their place 
because he keep calling out, are you asleep yet? Are you asleep yet? Because he'll do that. And so he doesn't put cars in a row, but he puts people need to be in their places. So it, it just, you have to sort of look really into that person and see how those, how it presents with them rather than just that stereotype idea of cars and, um, do you know what I mean? It, yeah. Just really thinking about it. Yeah, I think that the, the idea of that kind of like low and high functioning and spectrums and kind of, you know, some people have it worse than others. It's, it's assigning kind of a value judgment to, um, to what somebody's needs are. And I think that is, and quite often we see particularly it's, it's disabledist in its approach in that it's saying, oh, well, if you have needs that make you kind of awkward to deal with in the world, then that's worse than if you're able to kind of muddle through. Um, and particularly if you, and we sort of talked about this, I think we touched on this earlier, of, of if you are smart, as in academically smart, that you are seen as more high functioning. Yeah. Um, now, you know, I, I sailed through my GCSEs and A-levels without, with barely looking at the textbook. Um, but when I got to uni, I felt a bit because I didn't have the structure yeah. to hold me. You know, I went to a private school where everything was very regimented and I was kind of, you know, held to account. As soon as I didn't have somebody help me, pull me to account. I went to this, I did not function highly at university <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but so, so for me, I don't think these terms are helpful. Um, I think one of the problems when we, in fact, even, even with just us having this conversation now, is that the, the voices of the people who are more disabled by their differences tend not to be heard. So particularly people who don't speak, for example, um, you know, who, somebody who would not be able to manage in a situation like this because it would be too overwhelming for them. Yeah, my son wouldn't, and you never, that's why school has never known what yeah. he struggles with because he tells them exactly what they need to hear. Yeah, yeah. I'm fine. Yeah. yeah, I'm fine. And because that's he's not, the, he doesn't present as a problem to anybody. They're like, well, he's fine. And I'm like, no, he's not fine. <laughs> yeah, but even that sort of stereotype of, of you know, boys who who are non-verbal and all that kind of thing is like and who you know stim constantly and all that it's like well you know thinking about what are they what is that person's needs I saw somebody um on I think it was on um Instagram as a parent of a of an autistic child kind of talking about their kind of ongoing um trying to get their child to eat with a knife and fork um and that their child clearly found it very very distressing to eat with a knife and fork and they were constantly trying to force them to, to, fit, in. to fit in and I just I was watching this thinking why are you trying to make your child eat with a knife and fork when it's clearly distressing them because you do though because you want them, because you'd you want know, them. yeah yeah because we're all it. wanting to be in this world aren't we where yeah you're accepted yeah and that's why I say that masking is not beneficial yeah because actually in an ideal world, that child should be accepted exactly as they are. And if they need to eat with a spoon or they need to eat with their hands, then they should be able to do that because that's what their needs are. It I think it is in the work. world, but I think the world, I mean, that's why I speak up. I don't know why, whether it is with you. A couple of people have sort of been like, oh, here she goes again. And I will at every given chance speak up because I know I've had numerous friends message me and go, you've been talking about your stuff Marianne and actually it's really rung true with me and I'm like yeah great that you've been able to and that's why I'll always speak up because actually if the world starts being a bit more understanding that we don't all fit into this box of normal whatever normal is um just let people be who they are you know what yeah. I mean yeah. What I also think about that is well a couple of things one is Sophie you made a really interesting distinction between neurodiversity and intelligence level mm. um and you talked about how people often connect those together so it isn't high and low functioning from a neurodiversity perspective actually that they, they might be two different 
quite different things. Um, but also then Marianne, when you're saying there about, can we just let people be? I do think that it is quite mind blowing that when you do take the time to have a look back at some of the most phenomenal men and women in history um, and, and look at them now from a lens, from a, we have a bit more understanding of neurodiversities. Um, it's interesting to look back and go well actually do you know some of the people with exceptional skills so it's not only differences and yes some of the differences absolutely mean that people struggle within societal expectations but there's also differences that that can enable people to achieve things that others never never ever could yeah being absolutely. able to stay awake all night I can stay awake for days yeah. That and interesting for me, once Samuel was diagnosed and I was, I then was able to stop worrying about him because I did keep worrying because um he uh has likely got number dyscalculia, which is one of the lesser known um neurodiversities. In fact, school said, um, because the psychiatrist said it's likely he's got uh literacy and numeracy disabilities. So they looked at dyslexia and now they've said that he's got process he has troubles processing and I said what about the number dyscalculia yes it's very difficult to assess I said yes no it's not difficult to assess well even if we have him assessed we don't have any resources yeah. so but so I did worry about him but actually do I now no because he started he liked rapping where he's got that from I don't know um he writes his own music he has written raps he it's fine. And he was sat in bed at night on his own. And that's where that ability to just be uh, that hyper focus to, to do something when you've got your mind on doing it, which is why I think one of the questions I saw earlier was about if you've got somebody that works for you, yes, they might seem difficult. Actually, just ask them what they need. That's really the easiest thing. Just ask them what they need. To which I say, just explain things really simply, put it in writing, don't, com don't complicate matters, break it down. Um, but also, if you've got somebody on your team that is, uh, has neurodiversity, they'll be the one you can drop it on them the night before, and they'll move, they'll move mountains that night to get it done. <laughs> yeah, if, if their neurodiversity presents in the same way as yours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you are. Um, just, I'm yeah. going to pause there Marianne because we've got seven minutes left and I've got some questions I really want to kind of rattle through at the end um, so first of all I want to come back to Lindsay's because Lindsay's with us tonight um, and she asked about how you describe the autism spectrum and the high and low functioning so I think we've just about covered that um, but I she also says at the end, um, given that high and low functioning is outdated and given the recent controversy with Hans Asperger. So I don't know, Lindsay, if you want to explain what you mean by that question or if um, Sophie or Marianne get what you mean by that immediately. Yeah, I get what you, get what you mean. Um, so um, Asperger was a Nazi, um, basically. Um, and um, Asperger's syndrome is often or has been diagnosed basically as being kind of um, and very much in inverted commas this mild autism um, so somebody like me would historically have been probably diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome because I am again inverted commas high functioning um, and so there's kind of there's two kind of controversies there there's first of all with naming something after a literal Nazi um, and then but also ascribing that value judgment of this is a more mild form of autism rather than recognizing that it's just a different set of needs um and uh, again it's that part of that spectrum that, that isn't terribly helpful does that Lindsay does that cover everything that you were kind of were asking about or yeah I think I just I've struggled to find the right language to talk about autism in a way that actually describes what it is because all of the language that we use like spectrum and Asperger's and high and low functioning is very moralistic it is very prescriptive and, and gives an impression of oh people can be a little bit autistic or a lot autistic and that doesn't really make sense when you understand that it's an on and off 
situation. <laughs> and I just don't have a better way to really describe that. Yeah, I wondered whether how you would describe it that's yeah. more appropriate. I think I wonder whether it might help to sort of possibly contextualize what I'm about to say with a very, very short description of what the social model of disability is. Um, so, so essentially, the, the, there are two kind of main ways of looking at disability. The first and most commonly used is the medical model, which basically says that people who are disabled are disabled by their impairments, right? So I have a chronic condition that causes pain and fatigue. That is my impairment, but that's also the reason I'm disabled, right, under the medical model. The social model is makes a really big difference between impairment and disability. So under the social model, um, I still have an impairment, but the reason I'm disabled is I live in a society that doesn't meet my needs. So if we use a really, really simple um, explanation for that, Imagine if we have a wheelchair user and they want to go shopping, clothes shopping by themselves. They get to the shop and they can't get into the shop because there are steps up to the front. And once they manage to get help to get into the shop, the gap between the aisles is so narrow they can't get their wheelchair through. And the changing rooms are too small for them to get their wheelchair in and be, still be able to manoeuvre around. Short enough, so yeah. they've got three Sorry, <laughs> that is that. So that is the difference, right? They're not impaired. They're not. Their impairment isn't preventing them from going clothes shopping. They're being disabled by society. I think with neurodiversities, it's more that we have um, that we don't have an impairment. We just have a difference, right? But we're still being disabled because we still live in a society that doesn't meet our needs um, as people who are different. Um, so I, I tend to try and characterize neurodiversity as differences in the way that our brains work rather than being an impairment or a, or a disability. And does that do you, kind of help? Do you, so that does help because it helps me as well thinking about that language, but do you then always label from a autism, a ADHD when you're talking to people do you talk about neurodiversity and let them label it themselves oh, I think you know people people labeling themselves is really helpful um I think because it talks about your it's your, whatever your own experience is I think sometimes putting it a little bit into kind of you know clumps can help people to get access to the right resources and to have community and you know share what works for each other that can be really helpful um, I think being able to say what you need, though, for me, yeah. that, that's been the biggest thing is yeah. that I don't find some things difficult that maybe somebody else. I, I'm on a group with people that might f find some things hard and I go, well, I don't. But that doesn't mean so really, I think that even with at school with teachers being educated, because most teachers say they're not educated. It's not their fault. No. It's about teachers being able to identify possible ideas and then asking the student or yeah. when you're in the workplace, what do you need? Yeah. yeah. Oh, and that should be the case with, with any kind of disability Anything. or difference yeah. or whatever, is always, always talking to the individual because no matter what characteristics we share, we might have completely different life experiences and things that mean we experience those things in different ways yeah. and still have and different it, needs at the end. Yeah. It's interesting because as you're talking about that, I'm thinking about the fact that, yes, of course, we all have different frames of reference, but mm -hmm. actually part of our, I guess, unconscious bias is when somebody says something, uses a label of a disability, suddenly we put everybody with that disability into yeah. that box. And why, yeah. why are we doing that? Um, yeah, we think we know what they need. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be wrapping us up um, in the in the next minute. So I just want to say a couple of things. So one, you, one of our questions um, was about actually what do we do within training to be um, inclusive and accessible? And I think I'm just going to reflect on a, a, a few different things here. Uh, and But mainly I'm going to say ask people what they need. Um, so give people... At, the beginning be really open on us before the training session to say any differences um you know feel free to contact us and tell us what you need um and then set up the session in that way um to enable people to be open and honest and tell you what they need the reason i'm saying that is because also sophie is just undertaking a project for tay training um where she is pulling together um resources and information that we will share with the training community 
community far and wide for free that is about actually a bit of a step-by-step -step guide with regards to considering people with additional needs and um, differences and making in particular live online training sessions as accessible and meeting as um, many needs as possible so that is something that we're really excited to be working on at the moment and once we've done that we'll be we'll be sharing that far and wide so we'll make sure that 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 gets out there so that you do have something tangible we're aiming to kind of have that done for kind of mid to end may and then sophie's actually going to be running a free training session for trainers around making your live online sessions accessible um, and inclusive so we're going to do more follow-up work specifically on that i think it's your attitude as well i think that your I had a fed back to me last week I was delivering and two people out of 11 came to me and said, well, one said, I've, I haven't, I can't do the written bit. And I said, that's fine. And then one said to me, do you know what? I came into this. I'm dyslexic. I didn't know she was, I hadn't been told. And she said, I was absolutely dreading this. And I didn't think I'd be able to do all of this because it's quite a lot of writing and stuff. And she said, I've totally not felt like it was, she said, because you've made it so fun and interesting and you've been so open about yourself. She said, I'm actually going to miss seeing you tomorrow. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. And well, that's exactly it about setting it up at the beginning, isn't it? Setting it up that real safe space for people to be themselves and, and tell you what they need. Um, but we're going to finish off now because we're at 9.02, but I'd love you to finish off by just telling Becky who has... Um, put a comment in um, the chat specifically around um, any advice for people going through the assessment process but mainly I'd like you to finish off on resources books tools um, to help people understand this better um, is there anything that off the top of your head you're thinking this is where I go for stuff um, and then what we'll do is is we'll also put some links at the bottom of this um, this um, video as well. So let's finish on resources. The uh, I think Dave's put it in there about the um, ADD Etude magazine. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I read things quite often and go, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, that really, really good. I'm on some groups. Some people say groups aren't necessarily good. Uh, I found them quite helpful in that sometimes I've thought, that I was just a bit weird or a bit strange. I probably am a bit weird or a bit strange, but I'm with a load of other people that are like that. Um, and for me, it's just really being able to just identify people who see me as me. And okay. Dave, so to Gary, who's just as well. It's yeah. just that, I would say just identify with specifically, people. Marianne, because this is from a signposting perspective, sorry. Tell us specifically what some of those groups, where are, are you talking about? Facebook groups, LinkedIn Yeah, groups? there's a group on Facebook and it's um, ADHD for women. Okay. Um, and it literally you just get, there's some people that haven't been diagnosed. It's great because some people have been diagnosed, some people haven't. And it's quite good because everybody's just accepting in there because it's not just about getting a diagnosis because... Some of that is still dependent on whether you do or don't or whether you can afford it or whether you can wait that long. Um, but it's quite good because you can still go somewhere and feel like you can benefit from being around people who identify how you do. Brilliant. I know Sophie, right. where you right. So just popping over to Sophie, you've put how to, Sophie in the chat, you've put how to ADHD on YouTube is great. Yeah. Um, Tell us yeah, about so she, that and then also tell us about any autism resources as well. Yeah, so um, it's, it's a YouTube channel um, and it's a, a, a woman who's talking about she's her great. experience of ADHD and she's brilliant. Um, great. She really, really sets things out so clearly and yeah, and has great resources as well. So even just from that channel, there's lots of other resources linked from there for ADHD. Autism I found more difficult and I think for me personally, that really has been people in my personal life. Um, and I'm also chronically online. So as a, a lot of neurodivergent people are, because it gives us a great little <laughs> dopamine hit every so often when we go on social media. Um, but, um, but honestly, like, there are so many sort of, you know, pe finding people on social media who, um, who are talking about their own lived experiences can be really, really helpful. Um, just because it, it, it helps you feel Validates alone. It. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And I think quite often, when people are sharing their experiences and thinking oh hang on a minute that really resonates with me um it just 
it just makes you feel a bit less alone if nothing else no that, that's fantastic so i think um oh, so dave's also put in the chat a great introductory series of short films on youtube is amazing things happen um and also as part of the um the accessibility project sophie will be pulling together kind of some links for signposting and such like as well so we'll we'll do our best to um to make sure that we've got a whole selection but one of the reasons why sophie is doing this project is because can you really believe it that actually not nationally not internationally not google searches or bing searches or yahoo searches we can't actually find anywhere about how to ensure your live online session is accessible and inclusive for people who are neurodiverse or with differences so because we can't find it anywhere we're creating it ourselves and we're going to do that work and Has Tabby for frozen for, for everyone she's else? Frozen. As well? She's frozen in time. Yeah, I think she might be. I think we might have lost Tammy. <laughs> but it's a good time to lose her anyway, I, I guess right at the very, very end. Do you right. think, Sophie, for you though, one of the biggest things though is just being able to find people who you can be, be honest with and open? Because since then, I've really liked myself and I didn't before. Yeah. Because I was trying to put myself around people who um, criticised me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, very much the same. Yeah, I, I like myself a lot more these days. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I think, given that we've lost Tammy, we probably should just tie things up there. But and, Lindsay's the IT lady. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Lindsay, do you want <laughs> do you want to take over at this point, or should we just tie things up and uh, and thank everybody for coming? <laughs> Maybe you can both um, take a, a little second to kind of, if you had like one message you wanted to be able to give through this, giving in mind we're seven minutes past nine now, so it's as brief as possible. If there's kind of one message you want people to kind of take away from this, um, what would it what would it be for you? Do you start with Marianne, maybe? To be quite honest, mine's diagnosis or no diagnosis, just own who you are. Because when I deliver my training... I always say, because I teach people to teach, and I say, don't just go by what diagnosis someone's got. Just kind of create an atmosphere where they can be themselves. Um, and then everybody can just be themselves. Yeah, yeah definitely. I think for, for me, it's about building a, being the change we want to see and building a world where everybody is not just tolerated, but accepted for who they are. Um, and that obviously includes neurodivergent people yeah fantastic well thank you very much for your time then guys i'm sure yeah, tammy would be very appreciative of <laughs> your time and uh coming to chat with us tonight and we'll make this recording is going to be available on our mighty networks group for those who are part of the mm -hmm. training for influence community um and you can look out on there for um further developments from Sophie's project and all the other trainings that we're delivering coming up on the you know, social model of disability. I have written a course about working with, for employers, working with people with mainly ADHD, because that's coming from my point of view, but really it's neurodiversity, um, which people can contact me at 2mtraining.co.uk. Well, fantastic. Well, thanks very much, guys. Thanks, Look forward everybody. to seeing you all the community soon. Bye-bye.